you have to go after Iran in some way, shape or form, whether it's related to its leadership or to its money. And I mean, these are the things they care about the most. And um, and also its reputation, how it looks, how it looks publicly. If they need to see a message that, that, that indicates to them that the US is not afraid. These dictators and thugs don't understand the language of democracies. It's not the same. So we should, in my opinion, we shouldn't be afraid to, to strike Iran, but we shouldn't be afraid or, or, or Iranian targets in the region because that's the only thing they understand in order to, for them to take the United States seriously, to know that if they dare respond to that, that the US has no fear in escalating further. And so that's those are the kinds of targets that, that, uh, that you could see. They could also pursue other announcements like saying that the nuclear deal is off the table, for example, but they are gonna have to hit Iran. One last point I would say on this is that while Iran may not be behind every single execution of, of, of these attacks from these Iran-backed groups, these Iran-backed mm -hmm. groups across the region wouldn't exist if it weren't for them, they fund them, arm them, train them, they give them technical assistance and intelligence. And also on the flip side, Iran has the ability to tell them to cut it out. So that's why the message has to be at Iran. <laughs> okay, so how about with all of that said, Hagar, how about all of the above? What <laughs> odds would you put on an all of the above response to make a point from this administration? My, if I had to place a bet, I would say that their response would probably fall somewhere in the second tier. But, you know, it could, mm. listen, it could it could go either way. Second tier meaning and certainly an Iranian target, an Iranian high profile target. There are Iranian leaders of the IRGC who are based in the Middle East. They have vessels and diplomatic embassies and they have IRGC offices and 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 bases inside the Middle East, those are not the same as Iran-backed militant groups across the Middle East. So that's where I would expect um, an action to take place. And, and, and as Secretary Blinken has said, we expect this to be long-term. And, and as you said, it'll be tears. That's normal. It's not gonna be just tonight or tomorrow, whenever this happens this week, there will be multiple, multiple steps. And the, the point, the reason the administration's conveying that message is to say, it's not just going to be this. There is more to come, and we're going to keep you on your toes wondering what will be the next step. And of course, this is a decision that the president is making or already has made. We're just waiting to see executed on. But can the U.S. really make this kind of call in isolation when a lot of the strikes it has been carrying out against Iranian proxies have been done in concert with uh, the United Kingdom? Obviously, there's the wider maritime task force in the Red Sea and the consideration as well of Arab allies like Saudi Arabia, who have been very reluctant to further provoke uh, Iran proxies like the Houthis in particular because of, of the attacks they have seen from those groups. How does the U.S. need to think about the, the wider picture here and the other countries at play? I, will per, I find the Middle Eastern leaders, all of them, including including the Saudis, have been very weak, in my opinion, in pushing back on, on how Iran has messaged uh, their views since October 7, how the Houthis have been behaving. The Houthis in particular, the Saudis themselves waged a nine-year brutal war against the Houthis. So for them to say for them to, to to come off as weak as they've been, I find to be quite a disappointment. Um, and uh, and listen, they have their own interests, of course. They're they're trying to manage their own public opinion uh, while still uh, while still advancing their national security and economic interests. So I I can see where they're coming from. But the U.S. when it comes to a situation like this, this is a, a, an, an instance of self defense. And, and the way the U.S. views it and the White House views it, and this is, by the way, why the U.S. doesn't, the, why the White House won't need congressional approval either, is because not only was this an act of self-defense, but whatever the response is, is specifically meant to eliminate the threat posed to U.S. presence in the region, which is why President Biden can take this decision um, as commander in chief without consulting Congress, um, uh, maybe consulting, but not not waiting for congressional approval. Um, and also, he is not likely to consult other Arab allies because it could leak. And I am sure you've seen the, the administration has been deliberately very vague on on who even conducted the drone attack in Jordan, which Iran backed group, where was it? But we don't know if it was Iraq or Syria. And that's by design because they don't want anybody to be on guard. They don't want that 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 militant group to have their missile missile defenses up or anything of that kind. It's the element of surprise is critical. And so if they consult anybody, it would I, I would assume it would only be the UK um, or anything or anybody in what's called the five eyes, which is the group of five um, sure. English speaking countries who are who share intelligence. You talk about the modeling that you would have been doing at the National Security Council in your time working for the uh, Obama administration, 
Hagar, to what extent is proportionality modeled? We keep hearing that, you know, we can't do this forever, responding to every drone attack with a million dollar cruise missile. How do we how do we manage this new age of warfare? Yeah, I mean, the proportionality is an, an important one because, and it's very important to the United States, um, the U.S. government. We um, assess proportionality very carefully, and and that comes for any any war. And I believe, by the way, for example, proportionality has to do with deeming how big a threat, how how large is the threat, how significant is it to the national security of the United States, its foreign policy, its economy, and and when something is deemed a significant threat, then that's what determines. Uh, whether or not you go after that threat, or what the collateral damage might be, and and how you go after that threat, and there are there are threats that that sometimes the U.S. doesn't go after because perhaps the collateral damage is too big uh, for a threat that is not actually that significant. Uh, something like this is very significant, right? Killing U.S. soldiers, something that results in killing U.S. soldiers, is significant. Now, I've heard some say that that there have been. Um, 165 attacks since October 7 from these Iran-backed groups, and that uh, this was the 164th, and and that they just got lucky um, on their end. Um, and I don't mean to use the term lucky on us; it's it's actually it's devastating. But on their end, and and that might be the case. But regardless, it's a red line. We knew that with this situation and how precarious it would be, that this could be uh, there's a risk of of something like this happening. And so for when it comes to proportionality, and you have U.S. soldiers who've been killed and you're you're facing that threat the proportionality is going to be assessed there there is no threat they're not going to go after the only thing that they're going to make sure of is that that there isn't a massive uh, massive civilian death mm-hmm. well speaking of of civilian casualties hagar that of course is very much in focus when it comes to the root cause of of a lot of this escalation and the way we have seen things intensify in the Middle East, which is the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas. And we know that happening in Paris in recent days, conversations still ongoing are talks to try to reach a ceasefire agreement in exchange for the release of hostages that are still being held, uh, held in Gaza, stopping hostilities for at least some period of time, especially considering the Houthis say that they are acting in support of Hamas, of Iranian proxies. If we could see an agreement like that, could that help ease not just what's happening between Israel and Hamas, but what is happening more widely in the region? I'm so glad you asked this question because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about the connection between the aggression pursued by these Iran-backed militant groups and what's happening in Israel-Gaza. So uh, cl- obviously, what happened, what's happening in Israel-Gaza, and uh, and and the, and what's happened since then and since October 7 has resulted in a massive increase in these attacks that we're seeing from these Iran-backed groups, militants, the Houthis, all of them. Um, uh, but their claim that they're doing it to fight for the Palestinian mission or cause, or that they're doing it to protest uh, against the war and to protect Palestinians is, is, is a lie. The reason they do this is in part because whenever, anytime there's instability in the region, wherever, whatever it might be, they use it as an opportunity to create more trouble. And the reason they do that is not only because they're troublemakers and they like to do that, but because It's how they gain legitimacy and notoriety. And reeling in a big fish, like goading the United States into a war for them is is massive. It would allow them to fundraise further, to recruit further, to get more notoriety publicly, to be back on the map, to have Iran look at them like, like the darling, you know? And so that is why they pursue this type of behavior. And it's why they don't really care about goading the United States into a war because they have nothing to lose. They don't, they, it's, it's not about whether or not they'd win. They'd obviously lose. It's mm-hmm. it's about putting them on the map, 